Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is John Beck and um, I'm an artist, an academic, and Matthew Cornford there is um, an artist. Um, and what I want to do for the first 10 minutes is just kind of do two things really. Briefly sort of take you through what our project has been so far. Um, and secondly, to sort of give you a sort of sense of some of the context in which we've been thinking about it. Um, so I want to do that quite briefly. Quite briefly, I've got quite a lot of slides, but I'm going to kind of whiz through them relatively quickly. Um, Matthew and I both now work in universities that, in, that contain within them um, art schools of the past. So I work at the University of Westminster, which is, uh, has Harrow School of Art as part of it. And Matthew works at the University of Brighton, which includes what used to be called Brighton School of Art. Um, but when we, when we, um, <coughs> we first started life here, um, this is Great Yarmouth School of Art and Design, um, as was. And Matthew and I both attended this art school at almost, we kind of crossed over a little bit in the early 80s. Um, this photograph was taken, I think, in around 2008, 2009. Um, and at that point, um, it was closed down. Now, Great, Great Yarmouth School of Art and Design was uh, opened in 1913 um, as the Municipal School of Art. Um, but by the 1990s, it had become amalgamated um, into uh, a bigger institution with the centre in Norwich. Um, and then it closed. Um, in the early 2000s, it was up for sale. Um, and at this point, we sort of, we realised that kind of not only a part of our kind of personal history had kind of sort of disappeared, but the, 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 whole kind, the whole kind of presence of that institution in a relatively small town had kind of sort of evaporated, uh, really. Um, and so it was a kind of personal, personal kind of story that we, we talked about, but also we had a broader interest in art schools and, and what they meant and what they signified. And, you know, like lots of people, we went to art school because it, it, it carried certain kind of ideas about it, about creativity uh, and sort of, you know, the, the, kind of, the kind of person you wanted to be and the kind of world you wanted to inhabit. And so the sort of loss of this institution seemed um, quite um, troubling. Um, for, for a while, there was a, I think the, the building was bought and there was a pitch for it to be turned into um, luxury flats, so-called. Um, Great Yarmouth, being a coastal town, is not in the market for a huge number of luxury flats. You might be surprised to, to hear. Um, uh, eventually, though, it did, you know, find itself, um, this is what it looks like now, it looks much better repaired than it did um, 15 years ago, and it has the Municipal School of Art tile work beautifully restored um, in a state that it never looked like in my lifetime. Um, but this is social housing. Um, very nice flats, I, I imagine, but it's not the Municipal School of Art anymore. Um, so this is the starting point for our project, and this was maybe about 15 years ago that we started talking about this. And to start with, um, out of curiosity, we started to wonder whether, they, whether there weren't other... We knew that there were lots of art... There used to be a lot of art schools in this country, but we wondered what might have happened to them. Um, and so when we were at conferences or visiting other towns, um, we would kind of track down the, the address of the local art school and find out what had happened to it. And as we discovered, there was a sort of pattern emerging inevitably, um, that there were the kind of the luxury flat reconversions, the amalgamations, the demolitions and so on. Um, and to start with, we, we didn't really see this as, a, as an art project, but just as a sort of story. And so we wrote an article for the Journal of uh, Visual Culture on the kind of the idea of, of art schools and what had happened to them. And that was an illustrated article with a series of photographs um, like the one of Great Yarmouth, including the one of Great Yarmouth. And then we did an, a series of talks um, and we published a, a sort of artist book um, which made a point of, of comparison between the closure of art schools and the, the building of new kind of signature um, museums of contemporary art in cities across the country around the sort of early 2000s and sort of create a kind of a story there about a kind of the, the, the sort of decline of sort of um, um, art school buildings and the rise of kind of art, art galleries. Um, and we included um, Great, Yar Great Yarmouth in that story. But it's still at this point, it's a kind of narrative that we're trying to construct rather than an art project that we're developing. Um, 
I remember at one point they were, we, we did have a conversation where we said, wouldn't it be, once we realised how, how widespread the, the art school system was in this country, and I think maybe between 170, 180 art schools across the whole country, you know, even in the 1950s and 60s, there were still that many. We wondered what it would be like if we could have a photograph of each of those and, pre and present um, a national picture. And that was a kind of an amusing aside in a conversation. But it started to seem like, you know, the way to go, you know, the, thinking sort of procedurally, if you like, we thought, well, what if we just did that? You know, what would happen if you just, if you just marched across the country and did that? And um, so we started to think along those lines, well, how would you do that? Um, how would you do that ridiculous thing? Um, and so we thought, well, when the Arts Council has a way of dividing up the country, um, they divide by region. And what if we were to do that? Um, this is still largely speculative until um, Matthew started to have conversations with Brian Biggs at the, at the Blue Coat in, in Liverpool. And Brian was really keen on the idea of the project. And so he kind of supported us in d developing um, a survey of the northwest of England's art schools, which we started doing around 2017 and put on a show um, in 2018, November 2018, um, called the Art Schools of Northwest England. And at this point, it, it had started to become a kind of, sort of, a, a kind of method, if you like, where we researched um, the locations and the histories of the art schools. Um, we figured out where they were, and Matthew set off um, to find them and, and to photograph them. And so I've got a few sort of images um, of the kind of work that we showed there. That was um, Barrow, and this is Blackburn, I think. Um, Preston, the Harris Institute um, in Preston, which notably was also for sale at the time. A bargain of 550 thousand pounds. Um, um, we also decided that it was, well, we, there was a point where we sort of said, well, what do we do if, if the building isn't there? And well, following procedure, as you do, we thought, well, you just photograph what is there. Because this started to become not a historical project, a kind of document of kind of, you know, what, you know, the old days. It was a, it was a project about contemporary England. Uh, and so here, this is, um, where is this, Matthew? Wolseley, yeah. Um, Wolseley. 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 <laughs> um, we decided we, pho we, photograph, we pho photograph what you find. And so sometimes the building has disappeared. This was a fire, I think, that, that, that uh, killed this one off. Um, yeah. Um, this is Accrington, I think, which um, is, well, I don't know whether you'd call those luxury flats, but that's what it used to be. Accrington School of Art. Um, and we also discovered that where there were sort of remaining buildings, this is um, um, Ashton on the line, um, there were these kind of quite remarkable de architectural details remaining in some cases, which we began to realise was part of the story as well. And so in addition to photographing the building or the site of the, on which the building stood, we started to kind of make a record of any sort of distinctive architectural details, particularly those that kind of announced the function of the building. You know, so often, you know, art was kind of bellowed out in kind of um, in big letters, or there were these kind of sort of elegant, um, distinguished sort of details. So the show in, in Liverpool kind of started to give us a, an opportunity to sort of see what this sort of visual story would look like when you put it all together. And so, as you can see, the, the details are featured, um, photographs of the buildings, and also, um, we also featured in, in vitrines kind of ephemera memorabilia and kind of photographs uh, and postcards of buildings um, as they were, uh, including some of those that are no more. Um, so this is, there's a sort of historical dimension to this, um, where we're, we're kind of interested in kind of retrieving those records and putting them together. Um, but also a kind of contemporary dimension where we're, we're interested in what the state of play is right now. Um, the second iteration of, of that Northwest project, um, the, the show at the at the Blue Coat kind of generated a bit of interest in the region. And we were asked to put on a show at Berry. Um, art Museum, um, but this was part of the Manchester Design Festival, and so it had a very different focus, and we thought, well, what would be, what would be really interesting was to take some of that material and kind of recontextualise it um, in relation to the 
um, rich kind of musical history that art schools contain within themselves. So we gathered together um, with the help of, uh, of Brian and, and Brian Biggs and, and other kind of enthusiasts, uh, a kind of a, a large display of um, album covers produce music and art produced by people who had at one point or another studied or taught in art schools in the region. And as you can see, that kind of counts as quite a lot. We also included a number of um, vitrines um, of, uh, uh, of design work. And we started to make a, a feature of the details um, blown up on um, and large, large format here in order to sort of draw attention to those particular sort of architectural features. So the, the, the Berry Show had a different sort of feel to it. Um, the third iteration of the show took place in Rochdale. And this, this colour wheel was, from, was extracted from a book produced by the principal of Rochdale School of Art. Um, <laughs> on colour theory, which was intended to be distributed to local manufacturers to train them how to kind of make good designs and make good um, colour um, decisions. And, and from, that, from that manual, we, took, we extracted the title of our show in Rochdale, which was called Harmony, um, Contrast and Discord, um, I think, um, which seemed like a kind of sort of, you know, sort of metaphorically quite sort of charged uh, title. But um, Rochdale was particularly poignant, I think, because the Rochdale School of Art does not exist. And so our photograph of it is of a car park. Um, what did ex does exist, though, is this technical school freeze, um, which is displayed in the car park as we speak. Um, and we, we, we exhibited that also. Um, but what was great working with the people at Touchstones Gallery in Rochdale is they had access to the sort of town store. And in the town store, they actually had preserved some of the stained glass from the original art school building uh, that hadn't been kind of, you know, seen the light of day uh, since the building was demolished. Um, Amazingly, we were able to bring that back into the gallery. And so the, the part of the building became part of the exhibition alongside a, a, a series of um, local history um, artifacts. And we also included in that show an exhibition of um, original artwork by staff and students that were part of the permanent collection in Rochdale. So what was great about these shows in Bury and Rochdale is that they, they started to become sort of dialogues with local communities and the institutions that, uh, that work there. Um, and it really became a kind of sort of collaboration between us and, you know, the galleries and the curators uh, and the sort of archivists and the, and the histori local historians um, to sort of retell those stories and unpack some of those histories that had been kind of stored away for a long time. So out of that kind of original idea about kind of going around the country and photographing the buildings, we started to sort of, sort of get um, a much richer sort of sense of, of that history. This was, an this was one of these examples. This is a, um, a bust of L.S. Lowry by Leopold Solomon, who was the principal of Rochdale. Um, and I think that, that, that bust did a lot of... That, that did a lot of work in its time because I think it, 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 was, it was exhibited in, in London and there's a photograph of uh, Solomon and Lowry there. But we managed to sort of find a new context to display some of that original uh, work. Um, so that's what, this is kind of what the show looked like in Rochdale. Um, so that's the sort of, that, that sort of, um, that set of three shows in the Northwest sort of, at that point, we, was, we'd, we sort of, we'd reached a sort of point with that. But at that point, we were starting to talk to Deb and, and, and Hannah at, the, at this gallery. Um, and there was a possibility of us developing a kind of similar project around the West Midlands, which is kind of where we are. So that's the sort of history of the project. Now, the second thing that I'm trying to kind of unpack here very briefly, just to give you a sense uh, of where we're coming from, is um, just to give you a sort of sense of some of the sort of uh, other contextual resources and influences that might have sort of fed into what we're doing. Um, this is a, I just want to show sort of a series of slides or, of images of, of projects and work by people that we, we feel that our, our project is kind of responding to in, in various ways. Um, these are a couple of paintings by Algernon Newton from the 1940s. Um, Cur curious works uh, where 
the sort of the, the streets are sort of empty of people and you may notice in our photographs there are no no people we're kind of interested in that sort of that that sense of sort of how you look the streets and what you do um, in terms of some of our other influences the work of Ed Ruscha's um, sort of photographic surveys of anonymous or otherwise overlooked buildings seem significant um, the work of Hans Hacker uh, in the 1970s kind of gathering information about kind of real estate um, holdings in Manhattan um, seems significant. We were all, always talking about um, the kind of work done by people like Robert Smithson and Dan Graham in the 1960s, which involved, which were kind of weird hybrid of, of sort of field work, um, urban exploration, um, photography, and sort of experimental writing. Um, the work of the Beckers and Ananumi sculpture and the anonymous sculpture, which took a kind of formal sort of approach to sort of the type typologies of building types, and the importance of field work. I think that we we started to think was an important aspect of this. Which is, you know, we could have you could quite easily gather a lot of the images and information um, that, that we've gathered for these shows um, on Google Earth. You know, you could do that in an afternoon. But there's, a, there's something about, you know, boots on the ground, I think, that kind of makes this a project that sort of looks closer and sort of face, face to face um, with the environment. So there were those kind of, those kind of influences that we've been mindful of. Um, in terms of photography, inevitably, the sort of new topographic work that became very influential in the US in the 1970s, we've had calls to look at, particularly the way in which those are also kind of depopulated landscapes, which I, I understand, you know, sort of has received a lot of criticism in various quarters. But there's something about depopulated spaces that draws attention to not only the sort of formal properties of landscapes, um, but it, it creates a kind of a strange sense of sort of ambiguity, I think, sort of, sort of that we're kind of interested in pursuing. The work of Aaron Siskind, who's sort of best known as a sort of abstract photographer, um, became interesting because um, he did a project in the 1950s where he, with his students in Chicago, organized a survey of all the buildings um, built by Lewis, Lewis Sullivan, um, which involved um, photographing carefully de details of architectural design. Um, and the point of this project was to explore possibilities for, for exhibition. And so he t there, there were hundreds of photographs taken, but it was with a view of kind of creating a particular kind of exhibition space at the end of it. And so we found that project quite um, influential. Um, we we're also struck by a number of sort of survey projects of one kind or another um, that we became increasingly interested in. Um, the Recording Britain project that you may be familiar with was sort of initiated in 1940 um, as a way of kind of sort of documenting the changing face uh, of, of the country and kind of enlisted, uh, I can't remember how, a, a, a large number of artists um, to record um, buildings and spaces around the country with, with text. Um, and this, this produced a kind of four volume collection, um, which included, pe included people like Angenon Newton, who we've, we've already seen. So we were interested in that. We were also, also interested in British iterations of the sort of new topographic um, sensibility, people like John Davies and John Myers who had a kind of very sort of, sort of often a very austere and kind of formalistic sort of approach to landscape documentary. But also importantly about looking at the overlooked, which I think is, you know, one of the sort of dominant sort of aspects of our project is to go places and look at things that maybe are not, not receiving the, the kind of attention that they might. Um, more broadly, we, um, those kind of surveys are sort of analogous to sort of uh, more more well-known surveys like the Pevsner collection of sort of uh, uh, the build buildings of England, which are sort of you know they they they're, in some respects they're a kind of bible of uh, architectural excellence in, in the UK, but they're also a kind of weird idiosyncratic sort of one person's take 
um, what, what constitutes value in this country. But we be kind of interested in the idea of this sort of obsessive gathering of information. Um, one of the people who worked with Pevsner on some of the later versions was um, um, Ian Nairn, who, who became better known as a sort of a more sort of outspoken critic of kind of modern um, urban life in this country. And his books also became quite interesting to us as a way of sort of sort of exploring, I suppose, exploring the nature of the country as it is now and its kind of textures and sort of um, its sensibility. Of course, there is a there's a there's a sort of subgenre of similar books, but we 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 feel sort of somewhat akin to at least some of these um, from J. B. Priestley's Depression Era um, survey of um, England, which was published in one iteration uh, as a with, with photographs. Um, Journey to the Heart of England was first published as the West Midlands. I think it is a book about the West Midlands. Um, but there's also a, there's also a series series of sort of more despondent, um, you know, state of the nation books like Goodbye Britain, Goodbye London. Goodbye London is a gazetteer of all the, I think it's from 1973 of all those buildings that are likely to be demolished. Um, and more recently, someone like Owen Hatherley, Hatherley's A Guide to the New Ruins of Great Britain, kind of sort of taking an inventory of where we are. And I think that sort of sense of, you know, sort of a, a, a kind of sense of a broad, somewhat opinionated survey of, of where we are um, is also sort of stands behind us. Another dimension to this is what, what we might call more sort of poetic doc documentary. Um, so the work of Patrick Keeler, um, who really started his work in uh, on London, sort of by taking still photographs before moving into films, um, but also the work of Chris Pettit, um, who in Radio On and London Orbital are kind of interested in the sort of not just the sort of material landscape, but the kind of affective um, dimensions of sort of space and buildings and environments. So we're kind of interested in that, and we're also sort of attracted to the sort of obsessives. And the archivists, both professional and amateur. So, you know, someone like Julian Cope, the uh, musician, who's the modern antiquarian, is a kind of gazetteer of kind of um, megalithic Britain, which is a great sort of, you know, obsessive gathering together of hundreds of sites. So we, we loved that. And we also loved the Defence of Britain project, which was initiated in the 1990s as a kind of early sort of crowd sourcing sourced activity to gather information on all the all the military bunkers and pillboxes in the country and inevitably they produce their own can we just flip back for one second um their own sort of set of guidebooks but also the kind of local history that is produced often p privately published um we got a real really interested in that kind of work, which is sort of driven by enthusiasts rather than by experts as such. You know, work on, you know, the picture palaces of Birmingham Solihull, or the pubs and breweries of the black country, or even the, the, the abandoned airfields of Norfolk, um, and even the gas works of Bedfordshire. There's a book on that. But, you know, this is, this is, this is people, who, this is, this is people who's, whose kind of commitment to their environment is granular in its attention to detail. Um, and, and determined to produce uh, a kind of document of that, regardless of its sort of fashionability or otherwise. So lots of, there's lots of material, I think, that we've sort of been teeming around in our heads as we've been thinking about these projects. And that's kind of led us here to Walsall and this exhibition that we're kind of putting on, thanks to Deb and Hannah and everyone at the Walsall Gallery. So I know that's very brief and a little bit breathless, <laughs> But hopefully that has given you a little bit of a sense of where we come from, what we like, or what we're interested in. And we can kind of pick up maybe some of those threads in the conversation. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. That was great. That was really, really good. Just what we needed. Um, yeah, so uh, I... Uh, I suppose I myself am an enthusiast of your project, and that, and that's why I've been invited to talk today. So it was um, I, when I started working as head of education at Icon Gallery in 2017, 
um, covering multiple programmes, including our canal boat with our youth programme. And Jonathan Watkins, our former director, came into my office and said, have you seen this, you know, um, this book? And I was like, oh, no, I'm interested in art schools. Um, and so you can see, like, with, with artist books, I'd usually keep them, you know, possibly in the wrapping. They'd be untouched on the shelf. But this one is, like, full of um, little post-it notes and notations. And it's a working document, you know. And it has really informed and shaped, defined our education worker icon. Um, particularly our work on the canals with the youth programme. Because when I was reading this book from 2014, I realised that our canal boat went on this journey across the West Midlands and we crossed and intersected with these market towns that had these Victorian and Edwardian art schools in it. So, and we're continuing to do that now with, I mean, at the end of this book, and if you haven't read it, I'd really urge you to do so, you pose this question about what's next, you know, what's the future of arts education, where, where is the art school? And in your little booklet here, you talk about the history of those art schools, and often they started out in, in people's living rooms or in the town, town hall or in the pub even, you know, before they actually got their buildings. Is that right? Yeah, very often. It took quite a long time to raise the money for the building. Um, and the art, art schools often started off in you know, a chapel uh, or a back room of a library or yeah, some, maybe sometimes in some, someone's house. Um, and so, it, it, yeah, it was a sort of slow process. It, the building didn't come first in most cases. No, so there's the, there's the spirit really, isn't there, of an art school, I think, that has endured and is continuing to endure, um, you know. Well, I suppose that's one of the things we, we're sort of wondering about, really. What, is, is, there, is there a spirit? What, what, what might that be? I mean, I think there's a, there's a, there's a sort of slightly romantic sense in that, I suppose, as a, as a teenager, that's, that's what I thought that I was signing up for, <laughs> but I don't know if that is necessarily the case. But. I mean, there is something incredibly romantic about your project in the sense that you were, you were educated in art schools, you've subsequently taught in art schools, and now the art school is continuing to sustain this research project over a very long period of time. You know, so the art school has always been there with you. And I'm intrigued to know, when you started at art school, what were you doing when you were there? What, what, what were you practicing or what, what courses did you sign up to? Well, I, I started doing um, graphic design. Um, and when I, when I was at Yarmouth, I mean, that really was um, way, that was in the very early 80s. So that was before, you know, computers and stuff. So it really was with drawing boards and um, cow gum and all that and all those kind of strange kind of back sort of paraphernalia and and i was strangely drawn even then i mean that one of the great things for me about art school at that time was it had a library full of art books and in 1982 that was like a big deal you know and suddenly this world is opening up you know and you can that's where i started looking at people like ed Rouchet. you know it was really really it was really uh, kind of because I didn't really understand. I mean, that's, that's always been. A, I didn't really understand the difference between, you know, what was art with a capital A and the various things like that. And I was just interested in pictures, really, and making pictures and how that all that worked. And in a way, um, the uh, that, that that Yarmouth time, in some ways, was was a kind of it. It didn't live up fully to the expectation of you know this kind of wild amazing sort of art school experience but it was an art school it was an art school experience and i think it was the i think it was the community that really i thought was really really important the way that you had this kind of small seaside town with with these kind of just art school students roaming around it into a january and hail you know what trying to make some sort of cultural something culturally happen and i think that stayed with me as a as, as something that's worth protecting and worth fighting for you, you mention actually in this book that, um, you know, on a lot of artists' CVs, um, they often drop the local art school and they go straight to the St Martins or the Royal College of Art and they don't mention where they started off. And I, I think, think that's quite, quite well, interesting. I used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think we both reflected on that when we went to Yarmouth and we started to think, well, 
in some ways it doesn't matter because it's not on my CV, you know, but on the other hand, it's something without that experience, better, I would not have progressed. I wouldn't have had any kind of um, progression into other art schools. I mean, that, and I, I think that was really, really important. And I think we were, when we, you know, when, when we started thinking about this is potential of this project, I mean, one of the things you first think about, well, there's, you know, there's a great big book written about the Royal College. There's this book written, fun, you know, written about all the famous art schools in London. And that drew me and John, I think, very much to, well, you know, let's, let's look at all the ones that aren't talked about. Let's look at all the ones in, you know, these other towns and cities that had art schools. And frankly, without which, none of those other biggest institutions would have, you know, they fed, they fed the students into those bigger institutions. And I think that was a story that I felt was being really ignored and overlooked. And we, the fact we couldn't find out, the fact that we actually... Even when we were doing the show, we were doing the show here. We we spent I don't know how long you spent finding out about Briley Hill. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the easiest. It wasn't the easiest part of the project. No, I mean, the, uh, I suppose we never really saw this as a pro. It wasn't a project where we wanted to find out where artists had once studied. It wasn't it wasn't driven by in, an interest in artists or even art that much. It was the, this, this idea of the the institutions and the kind of the kind of possibilities that might have, might have been been sort of made made available there yeah and you 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 have this period don't you that you stick to so it is the victorian and edwardian period is that right um because i know for instance with wolverhampton you had two art schools buildings that you could have well th oh, th three three there that you could have chosen but you've chosen one and that is the art victorian one it's <laughs> Well, it's complicated because, you know, we're having to make an exhibition in particular sort of spaces and obviously you could expand that and, I mean, Wolverhampton has, has an amazing 60s building, um, but there was a kind of degree of, you know, what could we fit in for this version of that show, but generally we've gone from the bulk of those art schools originated in sort of Victorian Edwardian and then there's some from the 1930s in that you know so we'll go right up to you know that that 50s period really but obviously there are there is another there is another project which would be to document art school buildings perhaps that were built as part of new universities in the 2000s or something but that might be for someone else to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. I mean, we don't. We haven't really set a, a historical frame around this. It's just like, as Matthew says, you know, sometimes it's like we need a, we need a, a, an image to go in the in the exhibition, and it needs to be sort of one of the buildings. You can't necessarily I mean, cover all the different. I mean, that, that that's one of the things. I mean, like with Coventry, there's there is another. There was an original art school which I've got the. But that was demolished, and I've got a shot of the site where it was. But and perhaps if we were doing a show in Coventry, we might expand that aspect. So it's a sort of honing of the project, depending on the mm. location, really. Um, can you, there's a um, a funny story when so just the nature of your collaboration, who does what? So obviously there's identifying the art schools, and then there's documenting them in photography. And I know you did some of this um, research um, and produced this exhibition during COVID, wasn't it? So who who is where? Who's with the camera? Who's doing the mapping? Matthew takes the photographs, and I sort of I sort of do the sort of archival work and the sort of the the sort of screen based work if you like sort of digging around for information and so on so it sometimes means that Matthew's on the ground and I'm sort of in sort of moon base alpha or whatever you know sort of operating the controls um, and so sometimes that does in, that does involve kind of awkward messaging where Matthew's saying well I'm supposed to, I'm standing on the corner where it's supposed to be but I can't find it and I'm on Google Earth going well <laughs> I thought it was here but maybe if you just walk down the street a little bit to the you know there are there are occasions when it gets a little bit like that but yeah. not very often but it, but it's also as I think John uh, kind of spoke earlier it's this didn't start off as a art Project per se. I mean, it started off as a conversation, then it became a talk, and then it became an article, and then it became, you know, and it's been a radio show. So it's a it's a project. It's a, it, an exhibition to a, for me a, a, an exciting development, really exciting development for it. But we're now working on a, for instance, we're working on we're working on an academic article about the kind of idea of the art student as a kind of cultural figure. Mm -hmm. We're working on a public art project. So there's a, it's it's a it's there's different things going on all the time really with it, and I think that's because we've. Well, there's two of us, and we can cover that cover that territory, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I love that, though. I, I want I want I always want it to be a number of different things going on. I think that's interesting. 
Why is it always a blue sky when you're there, Matthew? How come you get the good, the the good there's, lighting? There's, there's <laughs> a couple of reasons for that. Uh, 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 one, it, one is that trying to take photographs in you know, sort of in the winter months is pretty grim. You know, you've got a very short window. It's probably going to be raining. It's going to be cold. And, and, and the, you know, and the building is going to look miserable, you know, and sort of depleted. And I, di I didn't want the buildings to, I wanted to, I, I suppose, I wanted the buildings to, I wanted this to be partly a celebration, actually. I wanted these buildings to have some sort of dignity. I didn't want it to just look grim. I wanted it to look like, you know, they're, they're, these were something to be cherished, really, and something to be respectful of. And I and I'd, I'd looked at quite a lot of architectural type photography, and in terms of lighting, you get a lot better lighting in June, July. And then there was a sense in which this could all look quite. Um, I wanted to give have some uniformity to it for for the as an exhibition. So I guess that became. And then there was another of other kind of rules that you end up making up, which you regret. Like, okay, so they look better without cars. So let's have let's make sure we don't have no cars in. Now that, that adds hours and hours and hours, if not days to your work, because it's like, well, when are we gonna get the shot without the car there, you know? And then it's like, we won't have cars, we won't have people, we won't, you know, just to sort of kind of give it some clarity and, and um, consistency, I suppose. Um, so there are shots with out blue skies, but they're not the ones that get shot, that we get prints done of. <laughs> Um, and you, 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 you focus on the facade of the building when you do have a building there. You focus on that, that front generally and you don't really go into what was happening back of house, you know. Have, have you ever been able to access one of these buildings? Yes. Have you been able to get inside? Yes. And is that on your mind when you're there? Are you thinking, oh, that door might be open. I might just pop my head around If it. the opportunity's <laughs> there, I'll take it. <laughs> um, and some of the details like the stained glass windows, those are being photographed inside the building. So they are photographs taken inside the building. I mean, obviously there's quite a lot of buildings with that just isn't going to be possible um, or just isn't possible. And especially, you know, ones that um, are being turned into private accommodation, that kind of thing. And, but we have, I mean, we have got, we have got some shots of the inside, but it's also, it was again, a, I mean, it, it's partly the context. I mean, if you were doing a show just about the art schools of, of one town, then you might go into a lot more depth. But if, if you're trying to get what, what I'm, what I think we're trying to do, one of the things I'm really keen on is this idea of art schools were an ecology. It wasn't just one art school. It was a whole system of art schools. And I think that's a hugely important factor about how, how that system worked. And I think that's something that's been, again, was overlooked because you, as I say, you'd have the great and the grand, but you wouldn't have any, all of the kind of things that were feeding into that. And that's, that's the, this, show here is a way of showing just the sheer volume and scope of those different institutions and there's a you know there's a probably a phd to be written about every single one of these institutions and so indeed <laughs> there are some examples of that you know where people have gone into that amount of detail which is great but if you were to do that that would that was a, that's a different project well you, I, I i think you've said i've read it somewhere or i've heard you say it in a different talk that you can't tell the story of british art without the art school in it what could you what well I think I think you can and I think there's a lot of people who'd be very happy to tell that story and they'll exclude lots of things from it but I'm really I'm much more interested in including things rather than excluding them when we'll talk about art and art history and I think um, and I think if you look at not just in terms of where people trained who became famous artists but also the way that those art schools provided support over decades in some instances or entire careers for many many artists in the regions and I think that's that was a really understated value that they added you know that they, they were places that employed people who otherwise were going to struggle to find a, an income to sustain their practice and I think that's hugely important and I think the other thing I've noticed when you look at old uh, exhibition catalogues from the 70s and there's a lot of things that you notice about Oh, then. But one of the things you notice is everybody lists where they teach. <laughs> it's like with great pride. Oh, I teach, you know, I teach at Rochdale, you know, great, you know, and there's the so sense that's just been excluded. It's just been wiped. Okay. You know, and I, I go to shows and I know, I know where these people are working, but you wouldn't know it. It's like, what are we pretending that we're superstars? We're all earning a fortune. And it's, I, I think that's really interesting. And it's, it's interesting historically because you think, well, what was the impact of that? What did that mean? And also the institutions were really proud of these things as well, which is another thing that I'm, I'm seeing falling down in terms of when you look on an art school website now, it's hard to find out who teaches sometimes on those courses. And the other thing which we've found, well, John's looked into a lot more really, is around prospectuses. All those prospectuses were produced by the institution. They designed them, they wrote the copy, they did the illustrations, they took the photographs. There was a great sense in which this was a collective project. Mm. Yeah. 
it out of your um, so there's approximately 180 art schools across the country and then I might be wrong, I might be misquoting you here but I'm sure you said to me years ago that the Midlands had the highest density of art schools and are, are we are, are there around 40 here is in We've got 37 in the West Midlands and there's another 11 or so in the East Midlands. And so, yeah, the West Midlands probably is the, it probably is the, around the, the, the I highest. I think in terms of density, yeah. the West Midlands has it really, because, I mean, there was art schools literally within walking distance of each other. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? You know, that... Well, Stoke-on-Trent, there's several. Six. 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 Yeah, six there alone. So um, can you tell me what's what's unique about the Midlands then? What defines it? And, you know, um, what were the what were, in terms of the industries? You know, I mean, I was just talking to Julie earlier and talking about Bilston School of Art and Bilston's known for its ena enamelling. Was it enamelling? Yeah. And then obviously you've got the potteries and you've got the glass blowing. So what is it about the Midlands Art School um, generally? Well, that's what I suppose. I, I suppose you probably know better than better than I, but it is the, I suppose it's the close relationship between the art schools and and the particular industries in those towns, um, and so there was a there, there was for a long time a kind of sort of sense in which you really you really did want to train your local population to be able to work in those industries. You didn't want them to go to the next town and work in their factories, and so the sense of the the art school as a, as a kind of integral part of not just a local community but of kind of local economy mm. as well I suppose makes it very very distinctive. And where are the where are the schools located in relation to the towns? Normally they're normally pretty central because I mean you know you are I suppose this is this it, it does we do have to sort of roll back to times before cars and I suppose one of the one of the reasons for there being so many art schools in in the towns is that you know everything's within walking distance. Um, so they'll be next to the local post office and the town, the very town hall. Very often you find that the local architect <laughs> would design, you know, the, the local town hall, the art school, um, these sort of municipal buildings. And also there was a sense, I think the postcards indicated a bit, there was a great sense of civic pride about this. I mean, it was something to be really proud of that you had an art school. I mean, it was a status of the town and the manufacturing and the ambition. And I mean, that was one of the things I think for me with those architectural details, the fact that you'd actually, you know, carve the word art in stone and put it on a building meant something. I mean, it wasn't like these, I almost swore then, you know, anyway, was it was like those banners that you see saying, you know, we're great and everything's trained for it, whatever it might be, you know, it's got the flapping around in the wind that you see all the time. I mean, these things were just meant to be really permanent. And there was a kind of, they'd often, as we've discovered, spend years and years and years trying to generate the funds to build the building, you know, to, and, and it, it's, you know, when you look at something like Bilston now, it's kind of heartbreaking, really, you know, that that's just been left like that, grade two listed as it is. And um, as I say, there's, there's a sort of sense in which, that building would, would, you know, was right in the high street. I mean, Yarmouth was really, it was one of the main buildings in Yarmouth. But I suppose it is, it's also, it's part of that kind of the building of civic in infrastructure in the sort of late Victorian period, where you would have your library and your art gallery and your art school and your technical school. And they would all be part of a kind of a, a, a sort of a, a sense uh, of how how you how you, sh how you shape your community and what you what you know the, the resources that you provide for them. So you know that that, that makes a huge difference, doesn't it? If you've got art, art and science is often found next to one another, which you don't see much these days, apart from on funding applications. But you know the the, the idea that you know the art, and, art you had a you had a school of art, you had a, school, a technical school or a school you know science classes, and you had a library and you had an art gallery. Um, along, you know, and those were, and then you had the town hall, and those were all part of your kind of town centre. That kind of establishes, that, that sets out your stall, doesn't it, basically, is that, you know, sort of what, you've, what you stand for. Um, and I, I, I suppose we're sort of living in the shadow of that legacy a little bit. Um, but most of our services have kind of, sort of been pushed out of town, aren't they? And so, you know, as we, as we know. Um, so if you, 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 can still, you can still study these things in most towns, but you have to go to some kind of sort of anonymous, you know, sort of shed on the outskirts of town um, in order to do so. So you have, um, alongside this exhibition, you have on um, Instagram, you have the Art School Project. So you've been sharing newspaper clippings and prospectuses from the from the regional art schools here, and um, one of those which I quite I thought was um, quite lovely was Walsall School of Art. 
as we're here, uh, from the 6th of September 1968. And prospective students, there's an advert for them, and it says what they can study is pottery, silversmithing, sculpture, enamelling, dressmaking, embroidery, furniture, leather goods, bookbinding, jewellery, weaving, millinery, technical illustration, painting and decorating, printmaking, etching, soft furnishing, display, drawing and painting. <laughs> so that's from 1968 and such a varied and brilliant curriculum. When, when would people have gone to study these courses? Would it have been, would it have been a, like, you know, a daytime course? It would have been evening courses or? I think for most of their history, a lot, a lot of the art schools were, they were part-time students and they were sort of intended for part-time study. So, you, you know, the, so after work, there would be classes. During the day, there'd be different kinds of classes. But you would have a kind of, you know, often, you know, the list of students being only 200, 300 students overall, but there'd be a kind of rolling kind of program of classes throughout the week um, for different kinds of people learning very different kinds of kinds of things. And, and you touched on it in your introduction there that when you were at the Blue Coat, I think it was, you had the rec the vinyl records and looking at the, the bands who had come out of the art schools in the 50s and 60s. I know in Birmingham, Mosley School of Art is very famous for um, uh, the music that came out of there. Um, but can you just tell me how the uh, art school transformed in that post-war period? What happened to the curriculum? Well, it... I, it um there's a, there's a kind of good version and a bad version of that story in a way, <laughs> if you like, because I mean, what's, what seems to what, what happened in the in the early fifth what, what happened after the war was that there's a massive sort of surge of demand for for education of all kinds, you know, not not least after the the, the, the Education Act of 1944. So you have a massive sort of influx of students. Um, sort of people returning from the war and all the, all the people who hadn't studied before. So, you know, all art schools and other inst institutions were all packed here in the, in the 40s and the early 50s. But there's already a, there's already a kind of push to... They're, 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 people are starting to say there are too many art students. And the, uh, they're, they're, I found that there's a, the president of the Royal Academy sort of went on... It was a part of his mission, it seemed, in the early 1950s, was to give speeches complaining that there were too many art students and it was a waste of money. And the people pushed back by saying, well, you know, when you say art student, you're, not, you're also referring to all those thousands of students who are studying practical vocational okay, subjects. Exactly. They're also art students. They're not all, they don't all want to be Rembrandt, you know, for God's sake. And, but even then, there was a sort of sense where, wait a minute, we've got too many people studying these subjects. Um, and a lot of art schools were closed in the 1950s because they, uh, they were kind of they were ramshackle. They hadn't really survived the Depression and the war. Um, and they weren't always very sort of very well maintained. Um, but there was a there was a sort of there, there was a government committee set up in the late 50s to sort of assess the future of art education. And that resulted in 1960 in the, in the so-called Coldstream Report by William Coldstream, um, the professor of painting at the Slade. And they proposed a, a new um, diploma in art and design, um, which would sort of would be an attempt to sort of, you know, sort of raise the bar, if you like, of art education and m make it more on a par with higher education. Mm -hmm. And they sort of insist that in order to be able to uh, deliver this diploma, you had to sort of pass, the art schools had to sort of put together a programme and have it approved. Um, and this would include some academic context. Um, the, con the, the, the consequence of that is that Lots of art schools applied to be a diploma awarding bodies and failed. And so it sort of inadvertently created a sort of two tier system in which there were more prestigious art schools who could deliver these kind of higher quality, sort of, you know, more prestigious qualifications. And all those who sort of were sort of somewhat left behind. Um, and so that was, you know, that, on one hand, that, that's a good thing in the sense that art education was being taken seriously as a qualification. The bad thing was that not everybody was kind of benefiting from that. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of your sort of original question, you know, in terms of, the, well, the transformation is sort of like almost by accident because a lot of people who went to art school and became musicians 
you know, they, they benefited sometimes from the art school not being very good in the sense that, that you know, they were busy doing something else. Um, so it really does depend where you stand as <laughs> yes. you know, on, 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 on how you benefit from the institution yeah. as well. You know. yeah. um, so, I mean, yeah, in, in the exhibition here, we have art schools that are functioning still. Um, like like Birmingham School of Art, um, and then we have ones that are in states of dereliction, like um, Bilston, ones that are up for sale. I think Bourneville School of Art is now up for sale as well, um, and then redevelopment, or they've completely disappeared. So, I mean, what does this say now? Not just about the um, uh, the state of our arts education system, but also about public space too. Well, it's complicated. <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons it's complicated is because, you know, one, one of the things that's put forward is that these buildings are no longer suitable for purpose, you know. So it's not a case of we've got that somehow, art, I mean, there's a lot of art education still being provided and it's probably been provided, at, you know, against all odds at quite a high level um, by various, you know, local FE colleges and things. And they should not be, over, that should not be overlooked. But the, the, the buildings that these the, the, the buildings that a lot of these courses or these originated from are clearly we're losing those and they're going and I, I think there's something interesting to say about that which is that there's a kind of um, there's, there's a sense of history that gets lost when you dis, when you when a building goes and there's a, there's a sense of your well, your you know your identity if you you've studied at that institution goes but it's also a sense of its importance you know no there'll be imagine someone said oh well this this part of oxford university is not really useful for us to have anymore it was built in you know 17th century we're going to demolish that and build a new campus outside they don't do that they build the new campus but they always keep the old building and i think it's very interesting the way that art schools which we, let's not forget were primarily built for working class people there's been no very little outcry at the demolition and removal of those and that history and that legacy and i think there's a status thing that gets lost with that and that, you know it's just art and design it's not that important and i think nationally we i think that says something when you do it on a national scale and you erode all of those buildings and sell them off etc and all the people who went to those buildings all the people who studied in those institutions i mean what does that tell you about how they might feel about it, how john and i might feel about the fact that we've got qualifications from an institution that no longer exists and i say this is very um this doesn't happen across the board it's not like all education um institutions get demolished and reformatted a lot get a lot of the older more prestigious institutions are precise they use that's what they put on their front of their prospectuses so so i think there's a great loss there about the history and about and i think it's i mean i when i went to st martin's i sort of thought it was quite important i was walking i was working in studios that you know gilbert and george or richard long had been part of i thought that was sort of that was part of that kind of living memory really and that's all gone of course now as well so i think it, i don't want to claim too much about you know what's going to happen with art education i think i think if anything what i'm hopeful for is that the shows and the other you know occasions like this provide a bit of a platform for that debate to happen but i mean like and it's a and it's a complex debate and it's a wider debate but i mean it's obviously got a lot to do with what we decide to what we choose to fund and and i think i think it's odd that we don't fund art and design better given that we, we as a nation we have a really rich history of being good at it mm. you do you you are quite clear that you say this for you both of you it is a research project it's not a nostalgia trip you know you you try to remain objective with it and you say that um it's an in inquiry an urban inquiry an urban exploration into what existed and now what remains you know and i think i think that's really nice and you are very much focused on on the present moment through the project as well aren't you i think it would be it would it would be I don't know how interesting it would be to just constantly say weren't, weren't things better in the old days. I, I mean, that, that's not, it's factually inaccurate and, and sort of, you know, a conversation stopper in a way. I mean, I think what, what we're interested in is what's there now, you know, and, and yeah, you know, it's, it's inevitable that, you know, buildings rise and fall and, you know, and towns rise and fall and we all know that. Uh, and that's, 
that's kind of just that, that's just the way things are. But what's really interesting, and I suppose that's why I wanted to show some of those images of the, of the other kinds of projects that, that we've been interested in, that other people have done, is that there is a there's a value in gathering information, not just you know data, but also images. You know, uh, and the, the 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 photographs that we've got, the contemporary photographs, you know, are, will one day be historical photographs? Um, and so the the idea that we we are kind of gather, we're gathering material, if you like, in, a, in and of itself seems like a, a sort of valuable thing to do. In terms of sort of what you want to say with that, well, we sort of say lots of different things with it at different times, but we don't really want to kind of secure the meaning of the information that we've gathered in a very particular way, but allow it to sort of just sit there and for people to add to it, really, to say what they want to say. I mean, what's interesting for me, one of the things that's curious about it is the way, because it's quite, you know, there is, there's a lot, you go to somewhere like, where you go to Stoke or Trent, there's loads of interesting things to photograph in Stoke or Trent, loads and loads of interesting buildings and things. But I've got a kind of mission to photograph this one address, and that address is a coral betting shop. <laughs> like the least interesting thing in the whole town in a way. But it's kind of, then you have to try and make the best you can of that in some way. And that's, that's what was there on that day at that time. And, you know, that might be interesting to find that out in the future. You know, that's what a coral baiting shop looks like. You know, or that's what a car park looks like. What well, that's, you know, that's what a, you know, a, a kind of rather nondescript housing estate looks like because that's what's there now. And so in a way, those, those, that's why those photographs are, well, they're, they're, they're new photographs. That's, that's, that's the world we're in. Well, and also like the two photographs of Yarmouth, it's actually, it looks better now than it did when you first took the photograph. So sometimes, you know, it's weird. The, the quality of the building itself actually improves. So it's not, you know, it's not just the things we're, we know, we're not, it's not just, a, it's not a narrative of decline, I suppose, in necessarily. But um, in, you know. one more, oh yeah, I've got one more question and then I open it up to the audience. Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to end on at the point of you say in this book, which is titled The Art School and the Culture Shed, that um, art schools were uh, sites of making and producing, um, whereas art galleries, like the one we're sitting in, are very much ones of, um, of, of, cons of consuming, of thinking and consuming. So, um, and almost, it, I get a sense in the book that uh, these two, um, that it's a bit binary, that these two things are in competition with each other almost for resources, um, you know, and for funding. But um, for me, um, from my perspective of working in an art gallery, I, we can't work without our local art school. Our local art school provides us with our work, uh, with our workforce, you know, and they have their 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 spaces of production um, for our artists to make to use the facilities and also sites of research because they have these brilliant archives of you know brilliant pioneers of arts education who have been within the region as well. So um, we can't exist without the art school. But also, do, to what degree now do you think, in terms of that future, what's happening to arts education, what's happening to art schools, do you think that there is a way of involving them in galleries? And, you know, is there, like, like this event now, you've come back to the gallery with this research, haven't you? Yeah, so I just no, that's, 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 it's become full circle, haven't we? Yeah. Yes, isn't it? <laughs> no. Well, yes, I think in the best of worlds, you, you, you do what you're, you know, and you do what you're saying. I mean, you, you know, you have the art school, you, you, you have the art gallery. And I mean, one of the things that's quite um, upsetting in a way is that you go to some plans and, and the art school's been demolished and the gallery's closed. You know, you've got nothing. It's both things are gone. So, yeah, in, a, in, a, in an ideal, you would have both. And I mean, that would, and that would be not just in, you know, great cities like Birmingham, but it might be in other lesser known places as well. So you would have both. And I can absolutely, absolutely get the synergy of that. Um, and I think the for for us it's it's the, the gallery has been an absolute vital and 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 um, huge supporter of the project. I mean, you know, you know, with, whether it's um, the people we've been, you know, with War Soul or you know the other, you know, Blue Coat in terms of um, creating a, opportunities for us to not just make the to make the work, which is great, but also to amplify it and to you know create events and occasions like this. So yes, I'm not, I'm not in conflict with that. And I, and I, I agree it's, it's, it, if, if it's that, that, maybe that book sets it up as a bit more too binary. But what I, what I, what I found disturbing, I suppose, was the idea that you would have 
the art school had gone, and, and then the example that particularly that was most relevant to here, I guess, was the um, the public. So you have the you have a, you have the arts council and other funders spending what was it seventy five million pounds on a building called the public, and the art school, as we know, is no longer an art school, the West Brom Bromwich School of Art, and. I thought there was a balance there that was that was out of balance. It seemed to me, complete for lots of reasons, and as we know, that that didn't end didn't end well. Whereas I think I think the the history of this shows us that a lot the art school was an integral part, along with the gallery, along with the library of of, of what you would have in a, in a in a reason you know in a, in a town as seen as, as as part of the civic infrastructure. And indeed, some art schools, of course, were originally part of the gallery. You would have the gallery like in Wolverhampton, where the gallery and the art school were one in the same building. And um, we have kind of reclaimed an old building, which is a, a head post office for our art school, and it kind of in, like fuses us into uh, this sort of history of a building, which is not this is not our building. So I'm really curious to know across all your photos whether you've found any instances of universities reclaiming these buildings. That's a good question. I can't think of one. But I can't think of a particular, no, that, that's a really good question. What, what universities do increasingly do is that, is that they put on their websites the history of their buildings that, they, that probably don't exist anymore, uh, which they didn't used to do. When we, yeah, when we first started doing the project, they, you could, it was very difficult to find information. But a lot of universities are now saying, we have a long history, and here are the photographs of what we used to do. But the buildings that they used to do them in are no longer there. You know. I mean, it's also true. It's also true. Interestingly, um, Becky, about that is that some art schools, quite a lot of art schools, didn't necessarily all have purpose-built buildings like Yarmouth. I mean, that was a, that was that was an example. But I mean, there was one in um, Bolton, which was actually the art school there from when it started off, probably in a small reading room or something, took over a former secondary school. You know, so so art schools have been taking over. And, and educational institutions, you know, towns have a certain amount of real estate and they've used that in various creative ways. So that, that idea is, uh, it's great that, you know, that, if that works for, for you in, in, in Sheffield Hound, but that's not, that has happened before and it happened because it was convenient, you know. So there's been a num number of different institutions which for various moments become art schools. And one of the trickier things for us, and I think we sort of mentioned it, was that some of these institutions hop around, you know, they go to quite a few different places. I mean, there was one building in Leamington Spa and I was photographed and I was thinking, well, really? You know, this is like a suburban house, but no, that actually was where the art school ended up for some reason. It was the war. During the war, so yeah. This was the library, wasn't it? The, the, the Goodall Street was originally the library. Was that, was, the that was the library before it was the art school. So, yeah. In Warsaw. So that, that's part of, part of the narrative, yeah. whether it's just someone's living room, a website, you think we're shifting to what is an art school? Well, I mean, that, that, I suppose the, the, the people who organise the art classes in the, in the back end of buildings probably aspired to have a building, didn't they? I don't know if they wanted to stay where they were. So I, but I, I suppose it's a little worrying to think that we might be going back to that kind of atomised sort of um, screen-based sort of model of education. I mean, I suppose one of the things that we've been interested in with this project is thinking about the kind of sort of physical materiality of buildings and people in them, you know. Um, and what happens when you put lots of people in a, in a building and they do things together. So, yeah, I mean, it might, be on, it might be more economical in the end to deliver a kind of TED Talk version of the curriculum, but I wouldn't... I wouldn't recommend it, but that's a, that's a slightly dystopian reading of your question, I, I think. But. Hi, Claudette. Hi. Um, I, you were saying things about uh, the 
the people who went to art school being antiquarians and gazetteers and uh, stuff around the local culture and obviously it's post-war and stuff but where we are right now we're in a kind of internal war connected to art schools and I think what, what you said about um, the spaces that new art schools will find itself it's, I don't think it's such a bad thing to end up back in small spaces and starting small groups and seeing what emerges from that because I think the art school has become democratized, um, art sorry has become democratized with the amount of access and, and self-teaching you can do and, <coughs> and finding out stuff which one time seemed to be like a mystery or a secret and you were part of a secret club and um, and because art now, I think, I think you said earlier on that it, 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 it's more about product. Art has become a product, a service, I think. I think it's more integrated into society. So is, is, is this work you're collecting, is that going to be um, an archive of the past? I suppose it is. A, I mean, the photographs are... Uh, constitute an archive of the past don't they yeah i suppose so um i suppose it's there's, there's a did i suppose we're our our interest is in there are a lot there have always been other ways of participating in the arts outside of formal education and that's that carries on doesn't it that's what that's what people do um and th so yeah you're absolutely right you know in, in many ways we have access to all sorts of knowledge and information that we wouldn't have had before and so in that respect you know um access and availability of knowledge and information is far more democratically uh, open than it used to be but i suppose what we're interested in and what sort of the way that we drew up our list of art schools is what they were they were they were they were government institutions they sort of received government money um, so we were not interested in private art schools and kind of clubs of one kind or another, but those institutions that it constituted part of a sort of national education system. So we are sort of implicitly asking questions about what as a nation we invest in and what is valuable and what kinds of institutions we fund and who attends them and what for. So yeah, it's, you know, there are other broader questions about the arts and what people do and what kind of skills people might learn. But in terms of the government funding of education for the arts, where is it? What, was it, what is it spent on and who benefits? Those questions sort of implicitly embedded in fabric of this project, I think. Um, to, to what, to what extent is your project now want to go behind the facade and into the kind of human spaces that art schools are very distinctively and are you kind of tempted to get into that? I mean there are there are other models for that kind of research uh, as well but clearly you're you'll be opening up something really quite extraordinary and I'm, I'm really impressed by the way in which presentation holds this balance between almost energetic nostalgia on the one hand and almost unbridled outrage <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand you know because there is a, there is a sort of very positive charge here it's not just it's not just a lament it's actually asking questions and I think that those questions could develop in quite interesting ways, but with if you bring <coughs> if you bring the human voice in, I mean, I, 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 that's a, that's a, that's beautifully put. I wish I'd have said that. <laughs> but, um, but I yeah I, I I suppose one of the there's there's something about the kind of mute mute presentation of the of the buildings which which is sort of it's kind of deliberate but also it is an art it's artificial it's an artificial silencing um and we're very well aware that you know these are these are buildings for people and where, where stuff happens rather than just kind of you know, shrines to some sort of absent 
world is no longer there. But I, I suppose but one of the things that we found while we were doing the sort of promotional work and the and, and the archival work, by the, I was I, I sort of got really obsessed with the sort of newspaper archives. Mm. Um, and I was posting kind of articles on Instagram from the local press fairly randomly over the region and over time um, of reports of what, you know, any, any story that involved the art school. And they're all about people. They're never about the buildings. In fact, you can find out very little. But it's all about, you know, the kind of odd, the odd sort of quirky sort of stories, but also some, sometimes quite serious kind of tussles over um, value and relevance. And so on, and especially when you go back into the 19th century, the articles can be quite long and polemical about the relationship between art and industry and so on. And it's all about kind of, s sort of status and investment and so on. There's a, whole, there's a whole other story there. And I think you're right that we don't, we haven't, we're not doing that in this, in, in the exhibitions. But it's kind of, it's operating at a sort of subterranean level. There's a sort of, there's, a, there's another story. Well, I mean, one of the opportunities we had was to do a um, short radio program, and for that, um, well, actually, a lot of that was done was done by uh, our, our friend and colleague Brian Biggs, in which Brian interviewed former art students, you know, who'd been to some of the colleges that we featured in the exhibition at the Blue Coat, many of which were no longer there, and that was quite it was quite heartbreaking frankly i mean it was quite you know some of these people were saying this was a life-changing event for me going to that art school i may not have become you know a famous artist but for me that was foundational on everything i've done and subsequently you know that my engagement with the arts going to galleries etc and these were people who were you know in their 70s and 80s and even in their 90s and and there is a i think there is a potentially a very rich um oral history project here. I'm not saying we're necessarily qualified to do that or if you know and I mean without being without being bitter about it I mean we, we've had a number of uh, grants turned down for this project so you know there was a there was a we, we did put, put pitch something along those lines because I did because I think it's it's important to understand how what these buildings meant to people you know not just sorry what the, the institution and what the, the, the chance to study in them meant and what actually went on inside um, um, but it's it, it might be bigger than us that you know that might be that might be a, another something to something to pursue um, and what but what was what was what was what was really interesting was the way the gallery's role was really crucial to that. Without the gallery, that would not have happened. And it happened because people thought, ah, oh, that's interesting. I can relate to that. That directly relates to me. In my, and they, these were people who you know, were in that region. So they came and they saw, they saw something that they had been a part of being kind of reflected on. And, and, and in a way, I think, I think that, was, that was something that was... I'd never, I hadn't really got that at all until we, until we actually started working that way. And we, we managed to, you know, get, get an awful lot of interesting conversations with that. And funny enough, at the, forgot, I've forgotten, but during the show we did at the uh, Touchstones, this was in lockdown and we, we couldn't, I couldn't, well, we couldn't go to the exhibition. But what we could do is we, we, we interviewed um, people, former art students on, um, and, and we put them up on YouTube. So we, we, we created this sort of little series of, conversations really and again it was fascinating just really fascinating stories about what people had done and how it what it had meant to them and what I really liked about it it wasn't about celebrity it wasn't about fame at all it was just people who'd been to art school and this is what it meant to them and I, and I think we have a, obviously we have an art world that's obsessed with talking about you know fame and stuff and it was it was it was um, it was you know just talking about someone who'd you know been to um, Accrington in 1970 and it, you know how, how they had developed their own work and ideas from that so I do I do th and I do think it's interesting and, and it will be and the thing is we don't do it now it will be there will be it will be too late it will be gone we've got time for one or two more questions hi there do you think that the decline of art schools was because the collapse of the industry in the region and that's why the schools were going down because there was no need for, I think for more artists because the industry has gone and I feel like the artists they travel across different places to start working there instead because 
there's no opportunity left, like in London or Nottingham. And then even after studying there, they might go to Japan because there's loads of different industries involving the arts there. And then if we reintroduce them, do you think the industry would come back or would it just stay the same? Well, it's, it's, it's inevitably true, isn't it? The, the, the art schools kind of emerged and there's so many of them because there was so many powerful industries in a region like this. And yes, you know, their, their decline accompanies the decline of, of those industries. There's a, you know, that can't be, that can't be denied. Uh, I, supp I suppose this is, the, the, there are broader questions there about, the, about um, what, happens, what happens then, isn't there? You know, I suppose we're sort of living through that with the sort of the, the, the hollowing out of high streets in, in towns across the country. You know, what do we do? post retail you know it's a similar kind of question isn't it you know for 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 for, for decades we were told that you know if we just it was just all about shopping shopping was what was keeping us going and now that's not happening either you know so i mean those i, I suppose the questions of our, our schools don't sort of couldn't possibly sort of operate in a vacuum and their 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 success and, and demise is bound up with broader social economic forces i think I mean, this is a big, it's a really good question. It's a bigger conversation. You could do a conference on what you're <laughs> proposing, really. But one of the things that I think was very interesting, though, was that there was a moment when, when a number of art schools, the, you're absolutely, the, the industries declined, you know, the traditional industries that those art schools may have been servicing declined. But the art school continued and, and somehow or other. And of course, out of which people started to do all sorts of other things that no one would ever have, no, one's gonna, no one would have written a degree in pop music, you know, for you know, but they ended up being kind of spaces in which that could happen. And you put, and I'm, I think it's a shame that we can't have more spaces for young people to just hang out in and do things that are interesting without having to police it so much or justify it so much. And I think when you don't do that, you, I don't know what it would be, but, but I think it could be interesting. And that was a moment when I think some of the greatest um, achievements of art schools w happened. You know, no one, no one predicted that these were going to be you know, incubators for all this cultural um, success, but that's exactly what did happen. And it just seems odd to me that you would not look at that and study that and think, well, maybe we need more spaces like that and just let them get on with it, rather than constantly controlling everything. Oh, we've got one oh. Yeah. So just the last two, so yeah, just here, thank you. Just very quickly, I, I haven't got an artistic background, but I was at a meeting um, early in the week and somebody was talking about um, a session she'd been at where there'd been a second year arts student who'd been running a community um, program of doing art for people in the community actually as, as part, part of her degree so, so that the, the art has, has just moved to a different place and, and there's it, in my day when we were talking about oh well we're going to have we're going to have leisure. We're not going to have to go out and work and things. So therefore, there should be lots more art and there'll be lots more art schools. But it's just, I think it's moved and it's, it's developed. So a lot more people are doing it and they're doing it in graffiti. And you start looking at, you say you talk about fame, which is like a proxy for money. And you think, well, what about Banksy? Where, 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 does, where does he fit into the thing? Do, do you know what I mean? But it, 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 it's... Uh, Fascinating talk. It just touched, starting with the buildings, it touches mm. on sociology and, and, and finance and, and all that sort of stuff. And it's brilliant. But, you know, intergeneration, yeah. Maybe we'll take this question as well and then we can it's have just a final. Remark, really. um, uh, because you were talking about the relationship between the art schools and local industries. It made me think about the relationship between art schools, if indeed there are any today, um, uh, and, and industry today. And uh, if we think about how the university, the neoliberal university, has kind of, if you like, captured the art school, um, it's like hostage or something. Um, of course, now employability is one of the things, that, if that, one of the edicts of the, of the contemporary university that prevents people from just hanging around, like you were suggesting, Matthew. And, and the threat, perhaps, if you want to put it in those terms, is that employability uh, in relation to, to art in particular 
is seen to reside in the cultural industries, in the training of cultural managers rather than cultural producers. I mean, that's certainly the, the debate that's happening in, in my university, and it can't, it can't be the, the only one. So I think there's a, there's a kind of problematic way in which that, uh, that, that, that um, the, the, uh, in which employability yeah. is being kind of uh, understood by university managers and a kind of skewing then the, what gets taught in an art school in relation to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's really, uh, I mean, the, the thing that I was, I was thinking of was that a few years ago, we were all told, weren't we, that our children had to, be, had to learn to code and that coding if they, if they, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd missed the boat, in fact, and we should have been teaching our children to code years ago. But now we're being told that, you know, all coding will soon be done by artificial intelligence. And so all that, you know, that's what the missed opportunity maybe wasn't the missed opportunity at all. But you're right in terms of that kind of sort of, sort of corralling of the so-called create creatives into sort of this instrumentalization uh, of what counts as, as creativity. Um, and I suppose that is, uh, that is the sort of broader question that we're asking here. Is, what, you know, we don't need to train people to work for particular industries. We need them to think creatively and critically and independently and to do things that we haven't thought of before. Uh, and so there isn't an industry for that, is there? But they're the people that we'll need <laughs> for the industries that we haven't got yet. And so that, but that's a sort of weird sort of... That's a, you have to flip the whole... It, you know, higher education sector in order to facilitate that. But I think there are, there are sort of pockets of time in the history of the art school where that inadvertently happened. Um, and it wasn't always by design. Sometimes they said you had, a load of, you had a load of art schools where the industry had already gone. What would happen next? And sometimes unexpected things did happen mm. at certain points. Mm. Um, but the unexpected is hard to... You know, it's, 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 hard to, it's hard to fund, isn't it? Right? Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, thanks for such a brilliant talk and thanks for such excellent questions. So just thank you. Thank you. Thank you.